my name is Katie Derwan. This is my mom, Dawn. And on December 17th, our lives changed forever. This is my family, my mom, my dad, and their nine kids. My older brother, Ren, me, Shay, Rhett, Carly, Kyle, and the three babies, Lindy, Christopher, and Cameron. I was a teenager when the last three were born, so they were kind of like my kids as well. And this is Lindy. Lindy was so full of life. She was 20 years old. She was always ready for an adventure. She won homecoming queen. She was an extremely talented photographer. And this is my little brother, Christopher. He was 17. He had found the love of his life at such a young age, Marissa. We had no doubt they were gonna get married. And he was the perfect child. We would call him the angel child. I don't think he ever did anything wrong. <laughs> and then the baby of the family, Cameron. She had the kindest soul. She was just so beautiful. She was so full of life. And on December 16th, the day before, these pictures were taken by my sister, Lindy. As you can see in the corner, her and my little girl took a little fun picture in the mirror for a reflection. But Lindy took these pictures for Christmas for me. She wanted to do a last minute Christmas mini. So she took the, she asked if she could borrow my kids to do some advertisement. Right before she left, my little two-year-old boy, Bregman, gave her the biggest hug and we told her bye and I had no idea that would be the last time I would see or talk to her. December 10th, my little brother texted my mom and said, hey mom, we have a basketball game next Friday and they want the parents to bring us, it's in Monroe. They don't wanna take the bus cause it's too far, can you bring me? My mom doesn't tell her kids no, ever, for anything. <laughs> And she said, of course. So she took off of work. She went do her hair that day. My little girl was gonna go with them. I considered going with them, but when I learned that my brother's girlfriend and Lindy were gonna go, they didn't have room in the car. So I offered for my mom to take my car because I have a third row. And my little girl said, it's not that big of a deal. They don't need to, y'all don't need to switch cars. So they went, they went to Monroe. They went eat at Subway after the game. Christopher, they won the game and everything. And so they went to Subway and they left at 7.06. At 9.01, a drunk driver who was three times over the legal limit entered the highway on a, at a rest stop, going the wrong way. He was traveling 80 to 90 miles per hour. They had a retired state trooper who was paralleling him on the phone with state police. He witnessed other cars dodging them. They had an overpass, Malmark, it was exit 40, going um, I-49 southbound, but he was driving northbound. And about a half a mile after the overpass is when he collided head on with my family's car. We had no idea that this happened until the state trooper took my dad's phone and called my mom. He in turn called me and said, hey, mom's been in an accident. It doesn't look good, but she's stable. I hopped in the car. I flew to Lafayette General. Little did I know, Lindy was already dead and Cameron was gonna die four minutes after I got that phone call. So I turned into Lafayette General. This is my view, but it was nighttime. When I passed right here, I can barely breathe even till this day. When I pulled into the parking garage right here, I saw my younger brother Shay and my dad frantically running. So I rolled down my window and I asked them what was wrong. And my brother said, Facebook is saying that there was a fatality in the crash. I looked up Facebook, this is what I saw. Before we knew anything, it was already on Facebook. They didn't have names. I guess I went into like a defense mode and just assumed that there has to be two people in his car that died because nobody in my family could have died. 
and I included the text messages with my best friend because I believe it clearly tells the story of that night. So you can see I'm telling my friend about it. She says, oh my God, I said, we can't find my siblings. Only mom and Marissa are here. When I got to the hospital, I ran in the ER and I asked if all the kids were there. I named my mom Marissa, which is my brother's girlfriend. And they only had my mom and Marissa. So that was really confusing because I didn't understand where they were. And if my mom's okay, the kids have to be okay. They're 20, 17 and 15, they're resilient. Of, of course, they, they might be hurt, but I knew nothing further could have been, you know, they couldn't have been dead or anything like that. So the hospital can't say they were taken. I said, it's Lindy. So the state trooper called my dad and told us that the young blonde driver died. We assumed it was Lindy because she had all blonde hair, unlike in this picture. But my younger sister Cameron had blonde in, so we were pretty sure it was Lindy and I knew Lindy was most likely driving, but again, we didn't get a name. So I tell my friend it's her. Then I tell her my mom's injuries. I tell her Cameron and Christopher are critical. We think Lindy is gone, but no one can tell us. Only my mom and Marissa are at the hospital. So this is where we were, all gathered as a family. When my dad got the call and I hear him wailing that it's Lindy, it's Lindy. So in, as they were calling my dad, I picked up the phone to call my mother-in-law. My husband was with me. She thought we were calling for a ride because we were at a Christmas party. So as she answered the phone, my dad told us it was Lenny. So I started screaming and gave the phone to my husband. But this is where we were when all of this happened. So more text messages. I said, it's like we can't get any information. We're still not 100% sure Lindy is gone, but I think my brain is trying to give me hope. We still can't find any of the kids. Every hospital we call is saying they aren't there. She said, maybe they were airlifted somewhere. I said, that's what we're thinking. I just called Baton Rouge General, Kyle, which is another brother, called one in New Orleans. I called Lords over here. I called Opelousas, no one has them. She said, what about Lady of the Lake in Baton Rouge? Then she started spitting out hospital numbers to me and I would call them as she would give them to me. The state trooper told my dad that he thinks they might be at Opelousas General, but he really wasn't sure. My mother-in-law pulled up and told me to get in the car. On the way, she said we were gonna go to Opelousas because that was the best lead we had. So I called Opelousas again in the car just to see. She said, someone is here who is in a wreck, but they don't know who it is and I can go look at them. Only she didn't say you can come look at them. She said, you can come identify them. But to me, that still didn't mean anyone was dead. So this is uh, Opelousas. This is right where we walked through the doors. There was no one in there except a security guard. We asked him, we told him what we were there for. He went get a charge nurse. Charge nurse came out and said, the young lady I have here has expired. Can you tell me what your sisters look like? I couldn't spit out what they look like, so my husband told me, show him a picture. So I showed him a picture of both sisters and he said, come with me. And I knew that that wasn't good. And remember this whole time I'm thinking Lindy is the one that died. And I'm just trying to find the other two so they aren't alone because my mom was in ICU in critical condition and my dad was with her. So he led me back to the room where there was a white body bag. And he unzipped it and my mother-in-law was first and my husband was behind her and I was behind him and he unzipped it to her chest and I said, who is it? And she said, it's Cameron, my 15 year old sister. So I called my dad and I said, daddy, they got it wrong. It's Cameron, it's not Lindy. So I went into fight or flight. I need to find Lindy and Christopher if it's Cameron that died. So I said, we just got to Opelousas General. No one is even here for us to check in. I only talked to a security guard who's going ask a nurse. Whoever's here is expired, no identification, so they don't know who it is. She said, oh Jesus, please, no one we know. I said, it's Cameron, I'm in the room with her. 
She said, oh my God, if she passed, I said, she's gone. And that's Cameron. My mother-in-law asked him to please help us find the other two because we called every hospital. He left the room for a few minutes and he came back in and he said, I found a young gentleman. He's at Bunky General. I said, oh my God, thank you, God. At least he's alive. No, I said, at least he's okay. And I said, well, I know he's not okay, but at least he's alive. And he looked at me and he shook his head, no. So that's when I said, oh my God, Christopher is going too. So I said, well, what about my other sister? He said, she's still at the scene. They're extracting her from the car. They're having trouble getting her out. And I said, well, is she alive? And he said, oh no. So I went from thinking my mom was a little hurt to all three of my siblings are dead within an hour. So I tell my friend, only my mom's alive. I just identified Cameron's body. He told me I would need to go to Bunky and identify Christy's body, Christopher's body. This is Bunky. This is the exact trip we took. This is where I walked in and the ride from Opelousas to Bunky was the longest ride of my life because I knew what I was going to do. And then here's a recap of the timeline, but before I'll tell y'all about Christopher. I walked in and the nurse, they knew what we were there for. I had called and told him I was on the way. I walked in and he was laying on a hospital bed. He wasn't pronounced dead by the coroner, so he wasn't in a body bag. And he still had the intubation tube in his mouth. I could see his little teeth. He looked perfect. His nose was black. I guess he broke his nose, but other than that, he looked perfect. So this was the timeline because it gets confusing from when they died to when we knew they died. At 7.06, they left Subway in Monroe. 9.01, they're hit by a drunk driver. My dad called me at 10.29. At 10.33, Cameron was gone. At 11.05 is when I turned into the parking garage and realized that there was a fatality. One minute later, Christopher was taking his last breath. 11.20 is when we assumed it was Lindy that was killed. 11.58, left Lafayette General. 12.32, headed to Opelousas. 12.46, brought to a room to identify Cameron's body. 1254 learned Christopher and Lindy have also died. 115 left Opelousas, headed to Bunky. 149 arrived at Bunky. 155 brought into a room to identify Christopher's body. And 849, I finally got a phone call and found where Lindy was. She had been taken to Karen Crow to a funeral home. And then later that morning, I got a text saying we picked up your sister's body and she was transported to Pellerin Funeral Home. This was my mom's car before. And this was her car after. Lindy was hit. She was almost in the middle. So I think she was merging over. I know at night I'm pretty blind. So I know I would be like, what's those lights coming? And Lindy going 75 to 80 and him coming 80 to 90. She had no time to react. There was only half a mile in between her and the overpass. So it's not like she had miles and miles to see him coming. He came up on her so quick. I don't think she even knew what was coming. And I think her merging over a little bit is what saved my mom's life. And you can't see it in this picture, but at the bottom of the door were Cameron's, <laughs> a bag of gummy bears. And her last text to my mom was, mom, can you get me some gummy bears? That was her favorite snack. When my dad first went to the scene a couple of days later, this is what was left on the side of the road. And then here's the Life 360 screenshot where you can see they hard braked, which just means they, that's where the impact happened. And now I have a sister who has an obituary card. 
along with Christopher and Cameron. These are my mom's injuries. She had a bilateral carotid artery dissection. When she went to a specialist about that, he told her most, he's, ne he's only had one other patient who survived with that kind of injury. So the whiplash was so bad that it tore her carotid arteries. She had surgery to fix one of them. She had a splenic laceration. She was bleeding internally, which is why she was hypotensive on arrival. She was a level one trauma, which is the highest level you can be. She had her laceration fixed that night. She had a collapsed lung. She had multiple rib fractures, a sternum fracture, a wrist fracture, a left ankle fracture, and her right tibia, fibula, and ankle were fractured. I don't even know how she's walking today. <laughs> and this is just some of my mom having to get treatment. And this is Marissa. This is the girlfriend who was in the wreck with him. She's only 16. She was in the middle in the back seat and she was sleeping on Christopher's shoulder, which is what I think saved her life. She suffered a left femur fracture, right hand fracture, dislocated spine, C1 and C2 ligament strain, C6 and C7 disc bulge, severe whiplash and a left foot sprain. This was her leg in the ambulance and that's her femur break. And she's involved in a lot of sports. She's our softball pitcher at the school. She's in volleyball. She's in everything you can think of. So this is a big blow to her on top of losing Christopher. They've been in the same class since first grade. This is her in the hospital. And these are the three kids. I think they were the closest out of anyone because they were the last three at home. And this is what we had to go to. I had to wheel my mom into a funeral home that had three caskets with three kids in them. So we went from this to this because of one man's decision. Also, he died too, but that's not that important. This is my dad fixing their crosses at the wreck site. This is the first time my mom got to see where it happened. Put up some Easter flowers for them before Easter. And there's Marissa's first time visiting. That was last Saturday. We had a softball tournament in Pineville and on the way back, she wanted us to stop with her. And here's how my mom used to be able to take pictures with her kids. Tell me what does it look like in heaven? Is it peaceful? Is it free like they say? Does the sun shine bright forever? Have your fears and your pain gone away? Cause here on earth it feels like everything good is the same since you left. Do 
So as you can see, they were really full of life. Christopher was going to be valedictorian. He was a junior this year, but he would have been a senior. And I know he would have been the first of all nine of us to get that. Lindy was in college at Nichols and Cameron would have gotten her license on January 27th. And she was so looking forward to that. And this is how my mom has to take pictures with them now. I had to plan their funeral because my mom was still in ICU and my dad was with her taking care of her. I had to pick out caskets. I had to go shopping for their clothes. I had to find 18 pallbearers. I had to watch three hearses bring and take them away. And that's my little kids. The impact that one man's decision had on our family is really hard to put into words. Um, I don't think there's a day that goes by that we don't cry and miss them. Even going to the grocery store is hard. We see their favorite snacks. We see their favorite restaurants when we're driving. They were just so full of life and there's no way not to miss them so much every single day. Lindy was my two year old little boy's nanny and Cameron and her loved him so much. And Christopher loved him too. He just, he was always with his girlfriend. <laughs> but I have so many videos of Cameron, Lindy and Christopher with him. And now he's never gonna know who they are like he should. My 12 year old little girl was kind of like siblings with them. She grew up with them. She was closest with these three more than anyone. And just like that, they're all gone. I don't know how we'll ever get over this, but I just hope that if I share my story, it can maybe change one person's mind to get behind the wheel because had that man lived, I don't know him, but I don't think he set out to kill three teenagers that night. And had he lived, I don't think he would be able to sleep at night knowing that he did that. And I know most people wouldn't be able to and people definitely shouldn't think it can happen to them because it definitely can. 
So that's our story. Do you have anything you want to say, Mom? <laughs> Thank y'all.